Okay, cool. Um, so hello uh, and welcome to what is uh, I think the final fifth year lecture that we're doing. Um, so today I'm going to be covering oncology and palliative care. Um, these two topics that I actually found really interesting, but also quite confusing uh, in terms of what to revise, what to focus on. Um, so what I've tried to do is put together a few resources um, that can make this sort of as high yield for your revision as possible, basically. Um, and again, understand that you're all sort of in the depths of revision. So I'll try and keep this quite brief uh, to the point so you can all enjoy a bit of an evening off. Um, okay, so what I've done is I've split this into four sections. And these are the four areas that I think would be most helpful in terms of SBAs and then OSCEs as well. Um, in terms of cancer medicine, I think the key thing that you need to know is, is the oncological emergencies. Um, as these are the areas that you'll probably be expected to manage as a foundation year doctor, and that's the sort of level that UCL are setting their questions at. Um, then I've included uh, basically two summary slides on some of the core cancers. Um, however, I think knowing the cancers in a lot of detail is probably a bit above our level. Uh, so I was basically just focused on the key facts of those cancers, uh, particularly the two-week wait criteria, um, which I think is the, the best thing for you guys to learn. Um, and then palliative care is quite a hard topic in terms of knowing what to revise. Um, so I've written some questions and slides on areas that, are, that I learned and then seem to come up in, in questions and stations and stuff. Um, and then finally, I've got a few slides on some sort of ethics and law CPP topics, which again kind of regularly come up. Um, and then this is basically taken from my notes as to the OSCE stations that I prepared for when revising for finals. Um, hopefully I've put enough information in this lecture uh, to be able to, to have a good approach when approaching these stations, basically. Um, so to start a lecture, we'll do, do an SBA. Okay, yeah, very nice. Um, basically, uh, what I was trying to, to get out at this point is that um, any person who's had chemotherapy is essentially considered neutropenic until proven otherwise, therefore needs immediate IV antibiotic therapy and so needs to go uh, into hospital. Um, providing sort of an oral antibiotic regime in GP isn't, isn't, really, isn't really good enough. They need to be seen and treated immediately. Um, so just a, a slide on neutropenic sepsis, essentially. Um, so chemotherapy is cytotoxic by nature. The aim is to kill off the cancer cells. Um, and cancer cells are highly active, rapidly regenerating. Um, and that's what chemotherapy targets. But other cells that also have these properties um, and kind of get caught in the crossfire are your hair follicles, hence you often lose your hair, um, and then bone marrow cells. And if you wipe out your bone marrow, you basically wiped out your immune system and you become very, very vulnerable. Um, and then this process is at its peak um, within to seven to 10 days post chemotherapy. Um, or in the case of the immune cells, they're at their lowest seven to 10 days uh, post chemotherapy. Therefore, anyone who's had recent chemo should be considered neutropenic until proven otherwise. Um, so if they're presenting with a tachycardia or a fever, so signs of infection, um, there should be a really, really low threshold for starting the sepsis 6 and then getting antibiotics uh, in within one hour of presenting to any. &E. Um, and then a, like a good example of a regime you might use would be Piptaz and, and Gentamicin or, or Ciprofloxacin if they were penicillin allergic. Um, just a point on um, GCF, uh, the uh, GCSF, the granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Um, it can have a role, but there's certain criteria. I didn't really learn it. Um, I've seen a question on it, but I don't think it's worth your time really going through. Um, right. Next question.
Okay, excellent. So uh, again, the majority of you getting this correct. Basically, what we're trying to get out here is that this patient's got hypercalcemia. So um, some of the features, they've got this kind of cramping stomach ache and then quite a severe bone pain. And then when you look at the bloods, basically okay, apart from this really quite high level of calcium. Um, and the first line management for hypercalcemia is rehydration, which you've all gone for. Um, just a couple of points on, on some of the other answers. Um, so bisphosphonates can be used if this hypercalcemia is persisting. Um, prednisolone can be used um, in basically if somebody's taken a vitamin D overdose or um, sarcoidosis can be used as well. Um, and then uh, benzophenothiazide can be used to treat renal stones because what it does is it takes calcium, puts it back into the blood. Um, so that can be useful in terms of preventing um, hypercalciuria, but um, in terms of hypercalcemia management, that would actually be quite detrimental. Um, so why is this important? Uh, basically, there are two key causes of hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, which you'll remember from endo last year, and then malignancy. Um, and essentially, the, the high levels of calcium occur in cancer mainly due to your bony metastasis, where it basically releases calcium into the blood um, as it kind of invades the bone. Uh, and then you've got your classic symptoms of your bony pain, stomach pain, renal stones. Uh, it, can for, it can cause confusion, tiredness, nausea, constipation, um, things like that. Um, this paraneoplastic syndrome um, can be seen in some squamous cell lung cancers, um, where they basically release a protein that's very similar to parathyroid hormone and, and can basically raise calcium levels that way. Um, and then management, like we touched on, is essentially fluids and rehydrating the patient. Um, where you're just trying to flush the calcium out, essentially. Um, cool. Let's do another question. Yeah, lovely. This is your, your quintessential um, oncological emergency uh, question, but basically where you've got, um, well, so in the in this this case, you've got somebody presenting with signs of superior vena cava obstruction, so shortness of breath, uh, redness of the face, and these swollen vessels where the cancer is is occluding the, the superior vena cava, and this usually uh, occurs in, in lung cancers or lymphomas. Um, so in this question, you've got your chronic cough kind of indicating that this might be a lung cancer. Um, and then you, you give them your eight milligrams of dexamethasone twice a day, um, and that shrinks the cancer. Um, so uh, on that point, superior vena cava occlusion, um, we say is essentially what it says on the tin. The tumor grows so much that it compresses the SVC and then prevents drainage back into the heart. So the blood backs up into the veins of the arms, neck and head, um, which gives you these symptoms of, of puffiness and visible distended veins. Um, and then Pemberton sign, uh, which is shown in the picture on the right, is, is when these patients lift their arms above their head and then and all the blood basically goes rushing into the SVC. It can't drain, so it backflows into the head and neck, making someone go this kind of bright red colour. Um, chest X-ray CT can be used to diagnose um, and will likely show this mediastinal widening. Um, and then the management is, is your dexamethasone. Um, twice a day, given orally, um, and then with some stomach protection as well. Um, and that can use to be basically acutely shrink the tumour and relieve the obstruction. Um, sometimes the, the tumour is so big it can compress the airway. You might need um, an anaesthetist uh, or anaesthetic input. And then sort of chemo or radiotherapy can help to shrink the tumour. Uh, then the other point is, is in palliative care. You can, can use a stent essentially to keep it open if, if you're not going to operate or, or provide uh, chemotherapy. Um, then the other point where sort of dexamethasone is, is, uh, is quite useful to talk about is, is spinal cord compression. Um, and so, so as we touched on before, bones are common places for, for cancers to spread um, and they cause a lot of pain. Um, and there should be quite a low threshold for suspecting metastases in a, in a patient with known cancer and, and back pain. 
um, because then it can compress the spinal cord, which can quickly lead to paralysis and other symptoms. Um, your common symptoms being your focal neurology, weakness in the uh, weakness and numbness in the limbs, um, bladder, bowel incontinence, uh, and other classic spinal features. Um, and also cancers can metastasize to weird parts of the spine, so not just the lumbar spine. Um, so your thoracic spine is quite an unusual place to get pain. Um, so if they've got, got pain there, you should be extra suspicious. Um, and then these patients can need a full spine MRI in under 24 hours. Um, because like I say, they can present anywhere in the spine. So you need to have a look at the whole spine and they can often be in more than one location. Um, and again, the management's exactly the same. It's your eight milligrams twice a day of dexamethasone with your stomach protection. Um, then other things you might consider in, in a spinal cord compression are the keeping the patient flat um, to keep the spine safe, stable and reduce any pressure. Um, and then neurosurgery are likely to be involved to decompress the spine. Um, another emergency to, to be a bit aware of or, or know a bit about is tumor lysis syndrome. Um, so this occurs due to the destruction of a tumor or tumor cells by chemotherapy. Um, and so it causes the cells to die, split open, and they essentially release all their intracellular contents. So these are your electrolytes like potassium, phosphate, um, nitrogenous, nitrogenous products like um, urate, lactate, dehydrogenase. Um, and these will get released into the blood, uh, often in high quantities. Um, so then you, that's two classic signs will be high levels of uh, potassium or high levels of phosphate, high levels of urate. Um, the other thing you'll see is that calcium can be quite low. Um, and that's because uh, it tries to sort of mop up the extra levels of phosphate. Um, this typically occurs within 72 hours of start of chemotherapy. Um, so what normally happens is, is um, patients will be given prophylactic allopurinol. So if you remember from your, your gout management, that's essentially there to, to stop the levels of urate getting too high. Um, but sometimes it can not work or, it, or they can be, can be forgotten to be prescribed. Um, and then if it does, if this does occur, the investigations you might be, be looking at doing is, is an ECG for arrhythmias. So if you've got high levels of potassium, um, and then just your, your blood test to look for, for high levels of electrolytes, um, then essentially the management's likely to be keeping the patient hydrated, um, we've touched upon allopurinol. Um, then if there is hyperkalemia, that's your normal hyperkalemia management. If the levels get above 6.5 or you've got ECG changes. Um, and then essentially if all your treatment fails and you can't lower the levels, um, you can dialyze these patients to remove the, the high levels of electrolytes. Um, then the, so the, the last of, of kind of what I'd say the main emergencies is, is malignant bowel obstruction. Um, and so just a quick slide on this, essentially, again, what happens is the tumors uh, are growing or invading to basically block and obstruct the bowel. Um, which causes your symptoms of, of obstruction, pain, nausea, abdominal swelling, vomiting. Um, sometimes it'll be operated on, um, but often the treatment becomes palliative and symptom relief. Um, so decompressing the bowel through uh, an NG tube or, or stents can be used to open up the bowel and relieve symptoms in the short term. Uh, and then you can use enemas to, to relieve symptoms of, of fecal impaction. Um, so that's you, you kind of, oncological emergencies. Next, just going to do uh, a few SBAs, which are on um, what kind of the, the different styles of questions that they might give in terms of testing cancer medicine. Um, so this is the this is the first one. Okay, actually, what I realise I've done is I've not actually taken the answers off this question. Um, so we can just skip through this because uh, so basically we've got here is you've got a patient who's been it's been diagnosed with with breast cancer and this is whether you can uh, whether you knew your your uh, tumor marker for breast cancer um, which is CA fifteen three um, I think these are often quite good to know because it's very easy to put a, a question like this um, the so there there are a few common tumor markers to be aware of. Um, so your CA199 for pancreatic cancer, um, CA125 for, for ovarian cancer. Um, so that's that's one area that they, they might test you on. Uh, this is a question where I don't think I've put the answer on.
Yeah, cool. So um, again, the majority of you getting this one right. Um, so the answer is, is squamous cell carcinoma. And um, this is sort of a, a bit of one that UCL kind of like. Um, and there are a few buzzwords they might give you or they might give you some histology that indicates that they're trying to get at a specific type of cancer. Um, the one I've seen most commonly is this. So um, keratin pearls are very common in a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and so if you kind of see that, it's, it's basically pathognomonic of a, of a squamous cell cancer. Um, for those of you who like your histology, I've, I've highlighted what a, uh, a keratin pearl looks like. Um, but to be honest with you, I could never spot that. And I had to, to Google where it actually was on this, this image. Um, another, another one that often comes up is um, signet ring cells, which is, which is very common in gastric cancer. Um, so that's another way that they, they might test you. Um, and then finally, I've got, I've got a third question, which sort of shows uh, another way that they might try and test you in terms of cancer medicine. Okay, nice. So I thought this was a, a hard question because this is basically whether you know the association or not, but lots of you've done excellent here. So um, this is kind of another niche point that they often like to get at. Um, essentially, there's this association with uh, strep bovis and colorectal cancer. Um, so uh, if you've got a, a patient who comes in with, with a pneumonia and that's grown strep bovis, then you need to do a, a colonoscopy just to check that there isn't a cancer there. Um, just a, a point that I've written up there as well. Um, with pneumonias, you have to do a chest X-ray six weeks afterwards. Um, and the reason for this is because you don't want to miss a cancer that's hidden behind the consolidation, essentially. Um, so that's the reason you do a, a chest X-ray six weeks post pneumonia. Um, right, so what I've got is, is kind of two slides and they're, they're just big tables. There's a lot of information and this is kind of really to go through in your own time but what i've done is kind of condensed my notes into what i felt the key points for each cancer um i've not included management because again i think that's likely to be the role of a specialist oncology team um, but i do feel it is most important in terms of picking up symptoms presentations and risk factors uh, that might prompt you to request an urgent review or be suspicious of a cancer um and so yeah to, these are kind of Basically, the patients you're going to send for an urgent review who might have a cancer and therefore need to be seen by a specialist in two weeks. So the criteria for each cancer I've included in this, this green column. And these are the things that if they come up in a history, you should be thinking, right, this person could have a cancer and I need to refer them on. Um, then kind of don't forget to ask about your key warning symptoms. So fevers, weight loss, night sweats, fatigue. These are your kind of general symptoms of cancer. Um, when I'm doing histories in an OSCE, I tend to ask these as my first question when I'm doing a systems review um, for basically any any history, because then it can be, you can kind of try and rule out um, cancer being being the most serious diagnosis. Um, but then there are some, some organ specific uh, system areas that you might want to try and tease out the history. Um, so like for instance, some are obvious, any breast lump should be referred under two week wait, but others like, um, because that will be that will come out in your presenting complaint. That's how I've got a breast lump. Okay, right, that makes sense. Two week wait. But others like um, hemoptysis, that sort of thing, might not necessarily come out in terms of somebody who's got lung cancer, and you may have to ask that directly. Um, so I recommend going through this at some point, just so these two week wait criteria in your head. Um, this is kind of some slightly rarer cancers, but again, I've, I've thought I've included them here. Um, and just to point actually on the um, kind of ex explanation for a two week wait referral, if you're doing uh, a station. Um, so in the OSCE, you might be expected to feed back to the patient what your thoughts are uh, and what your plan is. And this is going to be quite a sensitive discussion. But um, the way I kind of like to approach it 
is to summarize back to the patient what they've said. Uh, so this could be, so you, you've told me you've been experiencing some rectal bleeding uh, that's been mixed in with the stools. Now, there are, there are many things that can cause that, but first I'd like to exclude anything really nasty like a cancer. I'm going to refer you on to the bowel specialists who will see you within the next two weeks. Um, and then I'd go on to say, well, this is an appointment to rule out a cancer, uh, and then we can investigate after that to see what else might be going on. Does all this make sense? Do you have any questions at the moment? And then we'd finish by safety netting. So if you feel really unwell between now and your next appointment, so for instance, if you're unable to pass stool, a few days or you've been vomiting you feel really faint and tired please go to a &E or seek medical help um so that sort of that kind of spiel is what i would include at the end of the history so if it's a, a 10 minute history and it could be for instance in, in our farms we had rectal bleeding um i'd say basically a minute at the end just to kind of summarize back and say look this is the situation um this is what i want to rule out this is what i'm going to do and there's part of the two-week rate criteria in terms of when you're referring is there's a tick box that says, have you told this patient that they're being referred to check for cancer? Um, so I kind of like to, to, to add that in by saying, um, look, there are loads of different causes for your symptoms, but the key thing I want to rule out is this. Um, I'm referring you to see the bowel specialist because um, we want to rule out that you've got cancer, not because I think you have cancer. Um, and that would be a way I'd kind of differentiate it. Um, then uh, basically just as last in that point these are some links to follow for um some infographics um so if you're a bit more of a visual learner it helped me to to kind of learn the the key two-week weight symptoms um so that's there um and then just to finish up on on cancers um i've put this slide in because i think it's be a harsh OSCE station, but it could be quite a common F1 scenario whereby you might need to explain to a patient what treatment they're going to be getting for their cancer. Um, so the actual specifics of the treatment and what to prescribe and when, etc., um, is above our level. But I think the rough basics of what each treatment is is, is quite good to know. Um, so surgery to remove the, the tumour is often the main treatment of choice. But these medical and radiotherapy treatments are options that can be done alongside surgery. So it's quite useful to just understand these terms. So neoadjuvant therapy is used before surgery um, with the aim of shrinking your tumour to make it easier to remove. Adjuvant therapy is used after surgery to essentially prevent the recurrence of a cancer. Um, this is commonly used in breast cancer, for instance. So once the initial tumour has been removed, then you go on to this adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant radiotherapy regime to make sure it doesn't return. Um, but then also these treatments can be the main stay of treatment, um, curative or palliative um, as well. So chemotherapy, we kind of touched a bit on earlier, but it's a very complex area of medicine. Um, but these are sort of the rough areas of, of you might have to explain to a patient, um, for instance, so what is it? It's a, a powerful cocktail of, of medications with the aim to kill off the fast growing cells such as cancers. Um, it's done in specialist chemotherapy clinic. Um, or a cancer center via an infusion. Um, depending on the type of infusion you're having depends on how long you'll be required to attend. Um, and then you might talk about a few different side effects. So because it targets fast growing cells, things like hair follicles um, might cause you to lose your hair. Um, and then you need to warn them particularly of, of the risk of neutropenia and then the importance of coming to hospital immediately, basically if they develop a fever. Um, and then you can kind of use this format to explain radiotherapy and immunotherapy as well. Um, the key side effects discussed with radiotherapy is the, the risk of skin burns um, and then also the teratogenicity of, of radiotherapy. So discussing the risk of pregnancy and how that it should be avoided when going through radiotherapy. Um, and then lastly, immunotherapy is it's such an exciting area of medicine right now. And it's essentially boosting your own body's immune system to target the cancer cells through complex mechanism of, of protein signaling and receptor marking but it's it's going to become a, a big part of of oncological treatment um but i think the the key things to be aware of are again the side effects um so basically what can happen if you boost your immune system is it might go too far and lead to autoimmune conditions um the most common of these is is diarrhea and colitis whereby your your heightened immune system can sort of irritate and inflame the colon causing diarrhea and discomfort um, then the other perhaps 
more serious is you can uh, induce a thyroid disturbance, either hypo or hypothyroid, um, due to the, the enhanced immune system. Um, this is an area that's kind of very sensitive to autoimmune, um, uh, yeah, autoimmune destruction anyway. Um, again, possibly a, a bit above your level, but I have seen questions on it, so it could it could well come up. Um, so that in itself is is a is a rough overview of of oncology. I think it's only a week, um, so I don't think it will be too big of a topic in, in your exams. But I think that, like I say, the key things to know is if you know how to manage your oncological emergencies, then that will get you through the SBAs. And I think if you can have a rough idea of the key two week wait criteria, because they're not going to do niche ones, um, it's going to be an absolute barn door, breast cancer, uh, endometrial cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, they'll probably be the four that it will be absolutely barn door. And if you can take a good history and advise on a two week wait, then you'll be absolutely fine for any oncology uh, station that comes up really i think um so moving on to palliative care um yeah palliative care is a um it's a hugely important specialty um and i actually thought it was taught very well during the session that i attended but essentially it was a one day or one afternoon session and, and that was it um and so if people miss it or subsequently people kind of fail to, to grasp the concepts and they find it very difficult in terms of knowing what to revise. So this is, is essentially a rough overview of what palliative care is. Um, the main purpose is to, to improve the lives of, of patients and their families with life-threatening illness. Um, and there are many different areas to do this. So pain relief is, is kind of a massive one and often the one people think about um, in terms of alleviating symptoms. But then also physical problems like a lack of mobility or inability to clear secretions um, or convulsions, etc. These sorts of things can also be addressed. Um, and then there's also this psychological element that comes with it, um, kind of coming towards the end of life. And then often it brings in spiritual elements too. Um, and again, people kind of think of palliative care in being in relation to cancer, but a lot of other long term conditions will also have a significant burden on people's lives. And then the palliative care team can also help to address these too. Um, okay, so this isn't something I, I think you need to learn, but this is two different studies to give an idea of the symptoms that people experience at the end of life or with advanced cancer. So this, this box on the left is, is symptoms in advanced cancer. Um, and then the box on the right, we'll, we'll come back to uh, in a few slides. Um, but this is kind of to give you an idea of the things you might be treating in the last few days or hours of someone's life. Um, this is uh, kind of a, a non-exhaustive list of symptoms, um, but with the recommended treatments, basically. Um, and then the reason I put this here is, is kind of as a bit of a guide as to what treatment you might provide for, for which symptoms. Um, and this might be of use in an OSCE station that involves you to write up a plan or prescribe something to treat a symptom, et cetera. And then these are essentially some of the things that you might want to consider or might want to add in just as kind of a bit of an extra thing um, in your plan or in your prescriptions. Um, so it's good to be aware of a few of these treatments. Um, and then something that, that gets covered quite a lot is pain relief. Um, and this is often the biggest aspect that, that patients talk about, care about, saying that I want to be comfortable and not be in any pain. Um, and you've got opioids at the, the top end of this pain ladder, and that's what people most commonly think about. But don't forget the kind of lower ranks. Um, I'm sure you're all quite competent and familiar with paracetamol and ibuprofen. Um, but again, good idea to remember the basic doses and then the contraindications for these. Um, and then you also have your weaker opioids, which is predominantly dihydrocodone is, is the main one that's used. Um, and then just things to note here, cocodamol it contains paracetamol so it can't be co-prescribed um, due to a risk of overdose so that's something that can come up sometimes um, the other aspect with codeine is that the, it's essentially the, the pro drug for morphine um, and in order to, to convert it to morphine you need an enzyme roughly 25 percent of people don't have the, the gene producing the enzyme so therefore codeine is not going to have any effect or any pain relieving effect for them so it's um, so if somebody says oh the codeine doesn't work for me then that might be the reason um, and I've included antiemetics because it's something I think you should know a bit about and should know how to prescribe. 
Um, these are essentially the four that I kind of learned. Cyclozine uh, and metoclopramide are, are good general antiemetics. Um, metoclopramide is, is good in gastroparesis as it's prokinetic. It encourages the bowel to move, um, but then that's a bad thing in obstruction. So contraindicated in an obstruction. It's also anti-dopaminergic, so it can't be used in, in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, domperidone is also um, anti dopaminergic but it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier so actually is quite useful in parkinson's disease um ondansetron is is used predominantly uh, to prevent chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting um each will have their own usage but basically the one i, I mainly remembered was was cyclozine um, and i found that cyclozine 50 milligrams tds is is quite a good option if you need an antiemetic and you don't really know what to go for um that's a good dose just to have in mind um Okay, so we've got an SBA here. Um, Okay, so uh, a bit of a split of answers, but the majority of you getting this one correct. Um, so I think this is one of the ways that they can test your knowledge of opioid prescribing, um, some sort of conversion, either in an SBA or an OSCE station. Um, this SBA is basically on, on your knowledge of, of your, well, your ability to convert a current suboptimal regime and then rationalize the, the breakthrough pain. So the current regime isn't working for the patient, so more is required. Um, and I've written out the, the steps of the calculation here. So, so basically our, our patient's currently receiving 60 milligrams in total. Um, so that's 30 milligrams twice a day. And that's their regular pain relief. Then they're also using um, 10 milligrams of, of PRN or more six times a day, um, showing that, that this, this current regime isn't really controlling the pain very well. Um, so then this is another 60 milligrams. So in total, this patient is is receiving 120 milligrams. Um, and then we can convert this to their new regular regime, which will be 120 milligrams. So split that into two doses, 60 milligrams BD. Um, and then onto the PRN dose, this is going to be a, a sixth of their, their total dose. So one sixth of 120 is 20 milligrams. Um, right. Hopefully that, that makes sense and kind of breaking it down will help the people who, who struggle with that one. Um, got a second question here. Yeah, excellent. The majority of you, you're getting this one, this one correct. Um, so this kind of is, is another way that you could be tested. And this is your conversion from oral morphine to subcutaneous morphine. Um, the conversion of oral morphine to subcut is, is dividing by two. Um, so again, having to work out that the total dose is, is 90 milligrams. 
and therefore the subcutaneous dose required is 45 milligrams. Um, what I've done here is, is again, tried to just add in that sometimes they'll put the total dose BD or TD or um, four hourly or something. So you have to kind of do a little bit of math sometimes to, to work out. So don't get caught out by different doses at different times. Um, work out the total dose that you need in your day and then fit that into your, into your regime. Um, so this is just a summary of, of opioids um, and what I think is useful to know. Um, the key points here are which opioids are safe in renal failure. So most notably fentanyl. Um, and then in, in terms of side effects, constipation is the key one. Um, and it happens in almost every patient receiving opioids. So therefore, the, the most important co-prescription is a laxative, such as Senna. Um, nausea and vomiting, also a common symptom. So metoclopramide is a good antiemetic to go with your um, opioid prescription. Um, then also there's this, uh, this bigger issue of, of opioid toxicity. Um, and it can occur particularly in the elderly or those who are opioid naive, meaning that they haven't received opioid treatment before. Um, and the, the, the big issue here is that they can go into respiratory depression. So uh, because of this, sometimes the, the patients might be prescribed naloxone in the, the PRN section so that it could be rapidly administered uh, in the case of an overdose. Then uh, this, is, this is basically, I think, a, a good table to learn. Um, so these are the, the relative conversions of, of different forms of, of the opioid. I've used 10 milligrams of oral morphine as kind of a base dose from which the, the other examples are, uh, are converted from. Um, again, the key one to note that you, you all basically did correctly in the SBA was that um, subcut IV, IN morphine is half the dose um, of, of oral morphine. Uh, and this is because it's twice as potent, if that makes sense. Um, other things to be aware of, codeine, tramadol, um, the weak opioids are 10 times weaker um, and therefore the dose you're required if you were converting that way would be 10 times the, the dose of your oral morphine to your codeine or dividing by 10 if you were going from codeine to, to oral morphine. Um, hopefully that makes sense. It's just a table to, to go through in your own time and there's loads and loads of questions on this out there. So um, it should hopefully start to stick if it hasn't already. Um, this is another slide for reference. Um, I think this is the harder end of the opioid prescribing spectrum and, and possibly a little bit above the level of, of fifth year or, or final year exams. But I've seen questions on it and I, I think it might have come up in our, in our PSA prescribing exam. So it's there for reference if you need it, but I wouldn't get too worried about converting morphine to fentanyl. Okay, so now this is the, the big topic that I think could be tested sort of with regards to palliative care. Um, syringe drivers are a very effective way of delivering um, symptom relieving medication in those in the last few days of life um, or kind of the other indications are essentially whoever needs it. So they might be unable to take oral medications. They might be on multiple PRN doses, um, it's taking more than two in 24 hours, essentially. Um, there might be large volume doses needed uh, or uncontrolled symptoms. Um, and essentially it runs over 24 hours so it provides this constant supply of relief. Um, and then what I wanted to draw your attention back to is, is those symptoms that patients commonly experience at the end of life. So agitation, pain, secretions, nausea and vomiting. Um, and those are essentially the areas that we're trying to treat. I've extended agitation to include confusion, uh, restlessness, convulsions. Um, but these are the common medications used to alleviate these. So um, and of these, midazolam is, is probably the most common. Then in terms of pain relief, which we've been through, this is like to be your opioid. Um, secretions are something that cause a lot of distress, so can impair breathing or, or bowel function. Um, so these three medications can be used to treat symptoms like cramps, bloating, IBS type symptoms or, or respiratory secretions. Uh, and then got the antiemetics as well to alleviate nausea and vomiting. Um, but Basically, this is, this is practically what you might be asked to do. Um, and so what I've done is written out an example prescription of how to prescribe a, a syringe driver. So um, as with any prescription, uh, make sure that you've got your, your date, your signature, your bleep written up, because these are easy marks. Um, don't forget them, essentially. 
Then what you're going to do is write out your four drugs. Um, that will go into your syringe driver to treat those four key symptoms. Um, so the four drugs I've gone for are combination essentially that I learned, which was midazolam for your agitation, cyclozine for, for nausea, morphine for pain, and then hydrobromide for uh, secretions. Um, the doses, if you were to prescribe this, I suspect will be given to you. Um, I, I don't think you necessarily need to learn that. However, I would get familiar with the, the BNF in terms of how to use it in case you do need it in an OSCE station. Um, but then the crucial part of the syringe driver is this little passage of text on, on the left under the fluid section. And I basically recommend learning this exact statement um, and just copying it out. So make up 24 milliliters with water for injection, run via subcutaneous infusion over 24 hours at a rate of one milliliter per hour. Um, and this basically means you'll be given a continuous dose that will last all 24 hours. Um, the other thing to remember is, is that you're using water for injection here um, and not saline or any other kind of fluid. Um, and then you draw this, this arrow or this box um, to show which medications you're including in your syringe driver. And it's essentially that simple. That's all you'll need to write up. Um, and then sort of as I touched on BNF, very useful um, make sure you're familiar particularly with the app because i think they're trying to get a bit tech savvy and using ipads and stuff but they may also um have a book there for you but uh if you're struggling with with palliative care or, or medications using it um this uh this sort of treatment summary uh, page is really really good and i'd recommend having a, a little look in that um it has a good table if you're stuck on your conversions or anything like that um and then also yeah, when you get there to your prescribing exam, this is really quite a useful page for that as well. Um, okay, so this is the the last section uh, now, and this is kind of covering a bit of CPP stuff because it always comes up and it's I think, relatively simple to learn once you've got your definitions down. Um, and these are just some of the things that you might be expected to talk about in an OSCE or could come up in an SBA. Um, so that being said, I've tried to put a little bit of it into an SBA. Um, so I'll have a go at this. Okay, cool. So there's a there's a, a split of answers, which are the, the the split I expected. The correct answer is, is E here. And uh, apologies if this was a bit of a wordy question. Um, and the point I wanted to make here is that you can accept the decision of the sum because the lasting power of attorney was granted more recently than the advanced decision. So therefore, it's, it's legally binding and acceptable to take the, the sum's decision there. Um, capacity and decision making are something that they love to test you on. So uh, kind of just quickly run through the different levels of that and, and what you should need to know. Um, these are just some quick definitions to be aware of and might come into play with your decision making as doctors um, and something you could potentially be asked about. Um, essentially, the point here is that the key difference between assisted dying and assisted suicide um, is that in assisted dying or euthanasia, you as the doctor are administering a med medication so you're administering medication with the intention to bring about death. In assisted suicide, you are only facilitating the death. So by either giving some advice on how to end life or supplying a medication, um, but not administering. Um, but crucially, both are illegal under UK law. Um, then a slight nuance on that is withholding and withdrawing treatment. Um, and this is regarded differently in UK law. Um, it's essentially uh, when a medical treatment is not providing any benefit to the patient uh, it therefore is not in their best interest so can either not be given or withdrawn if the treatment's already been started um, and 
sort of the best example of this is is CPR. So issuing a, a DNA CPR form um, is the medical team withholding that as a treatment because it's most likely going to provide no medical benefit and instead will cause harm and distress. Um, so capacity, this is uh, just a revision slide, but I'll highlight the key points again. Um, having capacity is essentially an individual's ability to make a decision. So it's about the process of decision making rather than the outcome. Um, and this gets talked about a lot, but it's, it's why somebody who makes a decision that you might deem unwise or a bit stupid, that they don't necessarily lack capacity. They might just have other reasons that don't make sense to you. Um, then capacity is task and time specific. So it will need to be reviewed again for the next decision, um, especially if they've been deemed not to have capacity previously. Um, the next time a decision needs to be made, you need to review that because um, they may have, have regained capacity. Um, that being said, you should basically always presume that someone has capacity. Um, so presume they've got capacity unless you have a good reason uh, to suspect that they don't, um, which brings me on to the, the box on the right. Um, so this is your capacity assessment. Um, it's called a two-stage test because the first step is, do you have a reason to assess someone's capacity? Uh, and then the second step is to actually assess it. Um, and these are the four steps that hopefully you'll know, which is you're assessing whether somebody understands the information you're giving, whether they can retain that information. Um, they can use that information to make a decision, taking into account risks and benefits uh, and alternative options. And then finally, whether they communicate that decision back to you. Um, so if they've met all those criteria, then they're deemed to have capacity. Um, and that's something that you might have to explain to a relative or a patient uh, in an OSCE station. Um, so then this is where the difficulty often comes in, as in who makes the decision of which treatment to provide when a patient lacks capacity. Um, ideally, we want the patient to make the decision. So that's why the, the top two rungs of the ladder are essentially doing that. So either they have capacity or they've made a decision in advance, um, written it down, uh, and, and that's their advanced decision. The next thing is, is that they can decide to have a specific person to make the decision on their behalf, and that's your lasting power of attorney. Um, as we touched on the SBA, whichever one was made more recently takes precedent. Um, then you kind of move into these slightly grayer areas if, if neither of those are in place. Um, it often falls to the most senior treating doctor to make a best interest decision, taking into account uh, the views of friends, family, things the patient said previously, uh, the rest of the medical team, uh, and then making a decision on what they feel is in the patient's best interest. Uh, and then these, these last two, two rungs we'll touch on in a minute, but are quite unique uh, situations. Um, again, another revision slide, but just some of the areas we've touched on. Um, so an advanced decision. Uh, is specifically an advanced decision to refuse treatment. The reason being is that you can't request or demand treatment normally. You can only refuse it. And the same applies when sort of thinking of future treatment. Um, and it needs to be very specific. So, for instance, it, it could be, uh, say, I, I get pneumonia. I don't want life-saving antibiotics. And that's only specifically for pneumonia. For instance, if they got cellulitis, then they that wouldn't apply. Um, if they got um, any other kind of infection that wouldn't apply there. It would only specifically apply to pneumonia if that's what they've written. Um, another one they could say is, is, should I require it? I don't want artificial nutrition or hydration. Um, and again, it, it just needs to be very specific. And that's the point you need to get across. Um, so you need to be over 18 um, and the decision needs to be made at a time when you had capacity aren't being uh, coerced and uh, are fully informed as to, to what you're refusing. It then needs to be written down, signed by the person and also witnessed by someone to make it valid. Um, and then this should be given to the treating team or, or a GP so that a clear note is in their medical records um, that that is what that they have decided. Um, I've included advanced statement because in an OSCE station you might get asked the difference. Uh, and the key difference is the legal weighting. Essentially, advanced decision is legally binding and advanced statement's not. Um, an advanced statement is simply the person saying what they would like or prefer in terms of treatment. So this might be something like they want to die at home or they would prefer oral medications to uh, an injection or something like that. Um, and then these, this would be taken into account when making the best interest decision, um, but couldn't be used legally to say this is what we're going to do. Um, and then lastly, you've got your lasting power of attorney. 
And this is giving somebody else the legal power to make decisions on your behalf. Um, and it's good to note there are the two types, one for finance property and one for health and welfare. Uh, they're not interchangeable, so you have to have the, the LPA for health and wel welfare um, to be able to make a decision on someone's behalf about their health. Um, and then the other key point is that the power to make a life-saving, sustaining decision, i.e. refusing life-sustaining treatment, uh, must be specifically given when they're granting someone um, lasting power of attorney. Otherwise, then they don't have the legal weighting to, to make that decision. Um, then kind of moving on to best interest decisions. Um, firstly, a, a decision maker needs to be identified. Uh, and this could be one of a few different people, but this is often the, the patient's doctor. Um, so then assessing what's in the patient's interest can be quite tough. And there are a few things to consider here. Um, and that's largely getting as much information as possible as to what the patient would have wanted. Uh, so involving friends, family, the person if possible, um, GP maybe. Um, and then fundamentally, it comes down to choosing the least restrictive option in terms of what has the, the least amount of side effects or negative outcomes. Um, and lastly, we've got these two situations on, on, in the middle on the right. Um, Quarter protection can be involved mainly in complex and disputed cases um, and can give a, basically can give a decision on whether somebody has capacity, whether an intervention is in the patient's best interest or whether an advanced decision is valid for a specific situation. Um, the other thing that they can do is appoint a deputy of court. Um, and the role of um, a deputy of court is basically appointing somebody who knows the patient better. Um, to, to make basically the person who can make the decision on the court's behalf. The usual situation that this applies in is when you've got a patient who's over 18 but might have a severe mental or, or learning impairment so don't have the capacity to make their own decisions and in this case the, the court will usually appoint a parent or a sibling for instance to make these decisions for the person. Um, the other scenario is, is an independent mental capacity advocate or IMCA um, these are individual, individuals whereby the medical team don't really have anyone to consult about what the patient might have wanted. Um, so this might be an elderly person who's got no family or, or notable friends and somebody independent to the case is, is appointed to learn a bit about the person and then help advise the medical team as to what might be in the patient's best interest. Uh, but at the end of the day here, the final decision still lies with the uh, medical team. Um, right, hopefully that's covered a few of the kind of legal CP definitions that you might have been struggling with. So capacity advanced decisions and best interest decisions um, are, I would, would definitely be hot on um, because they nearly always come up in, in some shape or form. I do think it's potentially worth just setting aside an afternoon or, or a day just to go through some of the CPP resources on Moodle because um, there are a few useful things on there and you might help to pick up a, a few marks or a couple of things to put into your OSCE spiels and stuff. Um, this is the last topic I wanted to touch on before we finish. Um, that's DNA CPR, which is another CVB OSCE favourite. Um, you might basically be asked to discuss this with a patient or their relative. Um, so it's good to know just a, a bit about. Um, firstly, I think it's quite good to understand the um, whole withholding and withdrawing treatment situation and this box is at the top is showing your justifications for withdrawing treatment um, and it's essentially based on this idea of futility and that this treatment will provide no medical benefit to the patient. Um, the other thing to note here is that artificial nutrition and hydration do count as medical treatments um, so therefore can be withdrawn if it's deemed that they're not in the patient's best interest. Um, with these decisions in terms of withholding or withdrawing treatment um, if everyone agrees, then this decision can be made locally, so on the ward or within the hospital. But if there's a bit of a disagreement or dispute, that's when you get the court involved. Um, and then it sort of goes without saying, but it's sometimes good to reassure people that basic care will always be offered. So washing, pain relief, um, if they can, food and drink should be offered as well. Um, but you do need to consider an aspiration risk with that one. Um, then what is CPR and why we do it? Um, as you all know, it's, there is a mechanism to, to restart the heart. 
Um, it's a last resort life-saving treatment, um, but it has a low success rate and lots of adverse outcomes, which if CPR is unsuccessful, can cause patients to die in this extremely traumatic and undignified manner, um, which is why the discussion should happen with patients who are approaching the end of life um, and may be at risk of an arrest as to what we should do in that eventuality. Um, for instance, should we do all we can to attempt to save your life or should we let you die peacefully and with dignity? It's a, it's a very big decision. Um, basically, recent legal cases have dictated that this decision must be discussed with the patient unless there's a clear justification not to discuss it. Um, for instance, the patient has said that they don't want to talk about it. Um, and it should be made clear that this, the discussion and the decision is solely about CPR. So all other treatments and care will continue um, and the decision will be made and signed by the most senior clinician. And it is a medical decision ultimately as to whether the treatment of CPR will be of medical benefit to the patient. Um, but like we, we touched on, it should be discussed with the patient and their family to try and see what their views are and essentially reach a decision together about what the best approach is. Um, that's essentially the, the knowledge basis of these stations. Um, the other aspects are is, is kind of your approach and how you interact with the actor um, or patients, etc. And um, asking questions like what they already know, what they've already been told, um, getting you up to speed with the situation at hand, whether your explanations are making sense, or if you have any, or if they have any other questions um, along the way, are always good good ways to to gain marks and and nail these kind of stations. Um, so that's uh, that's the end of. Um, of the the talk um i just yeah basically finally want to say thank you for for watching these lectures um we hope they've been useful it's been it's been a real pleasure to teach you all these last few weeks um and we've all really enjoyed it so so thank you um and then also good luck go well for these next few weeks um remember to take breaks try and enjoy a bit of time off in the evenings uh, if you can get enough sleep um, and I've no doubt that you'll all smash the OSCE and SBAs. Um, I understand it's it's nerve wracking, but I think the biggest piece of advice I can give for the OSCE is to try and relax, be confident, smile and just be yourself going to the stations um, and kind of try and enjoy it. It's, it's a chance to show off just how much you know, um, how good of a doctor you are and will be, um, because I think it is one thing that UCL does well and that's produce good doctors. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions over these next few weeks, um, feel free to drop me or any of the, the guys uh, a message and we'll be happy to help. But yeah, good luck and, and thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything, if one wants to say anything, but, um, but yeah, thank you. Oh, and yeah, appreciate it if you could fill out the feedback.